Hello, I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is Mulligan Stew, the podcast, music, film, food, and wine. And that's, that's the point I want to make on this particular edition. We have lots of, we've had tons of music interviews because that's, that's what I've been doing. But at the same time, I've also had a career hosting and producing and doing interviews for a show called Tasting Room Radio, which is uh, 10 years, the last 10 years of my life. And I love wines, of course. And, and when I f- see a book, when I find a book that strikes me, and I think that you would like to read or know about, then I go and find that person. The interesting thing is my wife, Meg, found this book. It's called Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. And the writer was Elizabeth Gabay. She is a master of wine. There are only a a couple of hundred of them in, in all the world because you have to give your life to wine. You have to understand everything about it. You have to be made to drink, perhaps taste 35 wines and know exactly where they were grown, what the name is, what the grape is, what the season was like. I mean, it's rid- ridiculously difficult. And she's written this book called Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. Right about now, Rosé may be the most popular wine in the world. Uh, it's 10% of sales around the world, but it's on a such a trajectory straight up that uh, it's an amazing story to tell and to listen to and to experience. By the way, if you're a guy who has a problem drinking pink, we have a, <laughs> we have a segment for you on this show because I've never understood that and neither has she. And we talk about it quite a bit. Elizabeth is so lucky she lives in a small village called St. Martin Vesuby. It's just north of Nice and just outside Provence. And August the 14th, by the way, um, a Tuesday for some strange reason, is International Rosé Day. In America, uh, it's, uh, I believe, the second Saturday in June. Um, Elizabeth is the president of the judging of the International Rosé Championship in Krakow, Poland, and they just did it. We're going to talk about that as well. We're going to talk about um, the shelf life of rosé and aging rosés, rosé and food, and some of the elements that are happening with this new rosé revolution, like brosé, uh, like a new rosé that's come out that is stronger than it needs to be so that those of you who place ice cubes in your rosé can water it down to then what a rosé level is. And we'll spend a lot of time on the color that people are buying and how important it is. And is it a summer drink only? Fruit-flavored rosés. Elizabeth, in order to do this book, tasted 10 rosés a day, 1,500 in total over a six-month period. And for that, I applaud her. And I love this book. It's a great read. Here's a conversation with Elizabeth Gabay about her book, Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. She lives north of Nice. Uh, First of all, I thank... uh, um, Elizabeth, m- my wife, Meg Foster Mulligan, who was the one who said, oh, look, look at this book at Rosé. I'm going to order this. And that was the, <laughs> that's where it all started. Good. Well, good for her for seat spotting that one then. You wanted to start a conversation. How did that turn out? Well, it was sort of one of those interesting things where I have to admit that um, I was probably as skeptical as many other people at the thought of a book on Rosé. Um, There was three other books published last year um, reviewing a number of rosés around the world, um, talking about rosé and food. And I had this crazy idea that I actually wanted to find out, not to recommend necessarily wines, but to discover how rosé had evolved and developed and where it was going. And I thought it was going to be quite a small book. And um, as it developed, I became more and more excited. And so that was, I was, convi- I was convincing myself as much as I hope the potential audience. I guess you're, you're ground zero because you live uh, just, uh, just uh, north of Provence? Uh, yeah, no, I actually live east of Provence. East of Provence. Um, but that, ah, north of Nice. I live north of Nice, but um, we are, my area of, Southeastern France is historically more connected with Italy than it is with Provence. Uh, I'm sort of between Piedmont and the Rhone. But but your reference for um, uh, rosé is from uh, Provence? It was to, 
Yes, I think so. I think Provence Rosé is really responsible for making rosé around the world as fashionable as it is now. Um, I think it's due to Provence producers and their, their desire to improve the quality that really triggered the excitement. So yes, that started off very much as my point of reference. Elizabeth Gabay, uh, Master of Wine. The book is Rosé, Understanding the Pink Revolution. All right, so let's let's t- have a couple of big questions here. Like, what shape, what form, <clears throat> what color is the revolution taking? Ah, mm. uh, that's a very, very good question because I, one of the things that I felt really came to light when I was uh, researching the book was there is this massive amount of um, commercial rosé, which is very good because that's fueling the interest, and 30% and growing of rosé produced is light pink and very much in the Provence style, in that it, you know dry, mineral, um, very fresh and clean. And so I wasn't really too sure where this was going to go. But then you get this... Uh, attitude of, you know, people who were really into wine always want something that's different to what everyone else is doing. And so now we're beginning to see, okay, the people on the table over there in the restaurant have a glass of pale pink rosé. Well, I want to show I'm slightly different and I know a bit more, so I'll go for the darker pink. You know, it's this cyclical fashion idea. Um, So I think darker pink rosé is possibly going to become a slightly niche, fashionable element. Um, Older rosé, I think as rosé quality has improved, being able to have maybe a vertical tasting of rosé, tasting some older vintages, that's proving to be increasingly exciting. Um, And my own personal uh, interest, I really do like natural rosé. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not that I'm sort of you know um, being funky and wanting natural wine and and all of that. But I just think it's it's pushing the limits a bit like Picasso does with art. I think doing natural rosé is really pushing the boundaries of what we can maybe find in rosé wine. The possibilities of rosé. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, this is good for Tavel in Italy because they make darker rosés, and I know that uh, a couple of years back they were. They were. They had a public conversation amongst themselves about: Do we follow this pink revolution, this light pink Pro, uh, Provence revolution? And they decided to stay with what they did and all of us have done. Ooh, some, well, actually, I've just been writing about this for an article, and there are some groups of winemakers who have gone for the paler style. Mm. I don't agree. I think they should have had the confidence, I think, improve the quality, but stay with their local style. How do I complain? You know, their sales have tripled Yes. Uh, since they want, went lighter. So I, I was talking to producers only last month, and I said, by all means, you know, it's not for me to argue with your bank manager. If this is the style that makes the money, that makes the sales... Do make it. That's what the the commercial market wants. But don't abandon some of your more traditional, darker styles because that is that will come back. Don't abandon it. Um, and that's something that I really think quite strongly about. I think we need in the rosé market to have variety. You, we don't all want Sauvignon Blanc. You, know, um, you did write an interesting column in uh, in Bibe dot com about food matching. And you said that with rosé, this is a source of untapped potential. Oh, yes. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Which is, again, why we need to keep encouraging all these varieties and older vintages. So we had, um, last summer, I did an appeal, and I said I would really like to taste some older vintage rosé. This is in Provence. And one producer called me and said, well, I have a 2006 vintage, but I want to taste it as well. Can you come round? So we went round to the house, and there's this lineup of roses going back to 1992. And he said, "We raided the cellar. I've only got some one bottle left of each one. Let's try it." And I said, "I promise, I will not write about it if the wine is bad." And the 1992 was just phenomenal. <laughs> 
Uh, but, you know, slightly oxidized flavors, sort of bitter orange, very, very good acidity, sort of umami type flavors. And that was the first bottle to go. We loved it. Everyone was going cheese. Um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful combination of complex flavors. There was an interesting point in the uh, book uh, that uh, described how some producers, if they hadn't sold their rosé within a year and a half, then they had a real serious problem of what to do with that rosé. So some can age, some cannot. So it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, I think nowadays the majority are beginning to age. Um, I know in Provence, really, they don't include it as an old vintage unless it's three years or older. So in Provence now, we we generally expect the wine to age about three years but when i spoke to a number of wine merchants they said even though the wine may have improved you cannot get the customer to try it Uh so there's an enormous amount of education the wine is there the the styles are there the potential to age is there the food matching potential is there um, and then I get really, really angry and sort of aggressive with cons- with journalists, and I say, mm. please stop repeating every summer, drink this wine young and look for pale pink, because yes. you are perpetuating this. And, let, and let's stop talking about just in summer, because Thanksgiving kicks off rosé season for us as well. And then on into our, our Christmas season here, we drink rosé year-round. Which is fantastic. You know, it's... There's why uh, the only reason you would only drink summer rosé in summer is if you have it ice cold, full of ice. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to be rosé; it could be but anything really. But, but they're making wines um, with the ice or water already in it, or, or no? They're making it stronger. Um, That's right. They're making it stronger, yes. Because if you put ice cubes in, it dilutes the wine, so the wine has to have more residual sugar and a stronger flavour to cope with the dilution. What are they calling that? Uh, that, that? Uh, piscine, swimming pool rosé. Yes, yeah, swimming pool rosé. <laughs> uh, to it be bother- honest, I've only tried them once and okay. decided that was it. Okay. Uh, does it bother you some of the marketing of rosé, the uh, 20-year-old's uh, swimming pool wine? It doesn't bother me. You know, it's life, really, isn't it? Um, it's not me. Um, I'm not going to be seen drinking rosé like that, um, <laughs> even if you paid me. Um, <laughs> if it, I don't, for me, that's not wine. You know, it's lifestyle marketing. It bugs me that people tar all the other roses with the same swimming pool bikini image. So from that point of view, yes, it does irritate me. Um, But if that's the only way some people are going to drink wine, again, you know, it's... uh, It's sad. It's not my world. Easy. Um, (laughs) What can I do? Yes, (laughs) exactly, you know. Um, but just, you know, just in the same way that it, um, it's the two extremes, isn't it? You know, there's a 20-year-old sitting by a pool, looking tanned, knocking back magnums of rosé, and then you've got the City of London image of men in clubs knocking back um, 300, 400-pound bottles of something else. Yes. So, you know, they're both extremes, and I think the vast majority of wine drinkers, I say, I don't know the statistics, we're just normal people that will have friends around for dinner and a bottle of wine, but we're not terribly, that is not an image that looks good on advertising. Mm. Uh, there's, um, there, there is, uh, you know, I, I'm dying to get to this because you're, you have a, a, a subject here, a, 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 um, a segment of the book just for the girls, question mark. Uh, Jason Wilson <laughs> of the Philadelphia Inquirer highlights a struggle against the common perception of rosé as a woman's drink. And here's the quote. What are you, a girl? Is this girl's night out? That's what a friend and investment banker said at a recent evening as the waiter delivered my glass of rosé wine to the table. I considered my manly friend from his pink tailored shirt to the insipid Coors Light he was drinking. At this stage of my life, I said, I'm comfortable enough with my manhood to drink pink wine. Yeah, that's right. I'm man enough to profess my fondness for rosé, especially on a steamy summer night before dinner as the sun begins to set. Maybe while pouring over the sports page, too, if need be. Yeah. Well, this is, I mean, you know, this is an ongoing dialogue. I I heard this rant about I'm not drinking pink 
five, six, seven years ago, and I thought it would go away. What's happened since? It's uh, with, no, So living in uh, the south of France, yeah, men do drink rosé. Uh, my husband was a confirmed anti-rosé drinker, not because of the color, but because he he said, this is not a style I like. And then, of course, we were tasting lots of different rosés, and he started to discover, oh, I quite like this, quite like that, and now prefers it to red and white. So, is it the colour? I mean, I don't understand why drinking rosé should not should be a girl's drink. Is it the colour or is it the style? Is it because of having slightly sweeter white Zinfandel style? Is it the packaging? Yes. Is it the marketing? Yes. Um, so I don't know whether it's just the one element of the colour or whether it's the all these other elements combined. And then when you get all these stupid films with people, <laughs> you know, uh, water guns with rosé or um, media stars, most of whom I don't recognise, driving around drinking rosé out of tin cans you know, and things. Um, Elizabeth, uh, you, you say in the book... The obsession with the color pink uh, um, is uh, starting to take a back seat, perhaps should take a back seat now, and we should just get on with discovering great rosés from around the world. Yes. So I'm actually thinking of um, enlarging my collection of black wine tasting glasses. (laughs) <laughs> just to uh, confirm the fact that, you know, this is not the colour. And indeed, the the Romanian section of the book, one of the, the people who enrolled to taste the wines to evaluate evaluate Romanian wine was blind. Um, so so they, they really took it seriously to avoid being uh, this implication with the colour. I don't know whether... I mean, quite interesting in that I would hope the colour side is going, but I was talking to an Italian um, Romato producer, you know, Pino Grigio on the skins, Mm -hmm. and he just couldn't sell the wine. So last year, he put it in a clear glass bottle so that you could see the pink color, and his sales went through the roof. So I think the emphasis is on the color is going slightly, Mm. but I think it's it's still very much a niche market. And again, I think I would like to be able to see influential wine writers. You know, someone like Eric Asimov, who, who I, I admire his comments on Rosé enormously. I know it, he's in the right direction. To get more wine writers like that, please don't start your review saying this is shell pink or petal pink yes. or a maiden's blush or anything. New descriptors. Um, Exactly. And sort of if you do have to mention the color, it should be, is it clear? Is it bright? Is it, um, it doesn't mean anything if you don't understand the wine. Elizabeth Gabay, Master of Wine, the book, which is a fabulous read and a great gift to other uh, friends of yours. Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. And it is a pink wine revolution. Uh, uh, As you say, um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Rosé was always considered the ugly duckling, but now the swan emerges. Um, uh, what is, uh, is it fully swaned, or is it a, a baby sw- What is it? I think it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's an adolescent. Oh. Can I go for adolescent? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a teenager. In, in that um, I still, I, I did have a number of people when I started off writing the book saying to me, but, oh, but you're a master of wine. Why are you wasting your time on rosé? Sure. Uh, and, and then you start questioning yourself and you start thinking, why am, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And then I would taste some other wine and I'd go, wow, this is fantastic. And now I'm getting people coming up to me saying, we loved rosé, but we never wanted to say it out loud because we thought we were the ones that were wrong. And you have now given us the confidence to say, we think this is a good wine. Which is why I say adolescent. You know, when adolescents lack confidence and they don't really go, go out and say, okay, I'm good at this. And it it's, doesn't quite yet have the confidence to be a fully mature swan and say, I can take on 
red and whites in a similar level. By the way, I just want to go back one question because uh, you've reminded me of the term brosé. Uh, in fact, uh, the term brosé has been successfully used to refer to the kind of dry pink wine that men can drink with confidence. <laughs> it's so yeah. it's so important that we keep their confidence up. Yes. <laughs> now, I wonder, is that because... Um, and so there was somebody on Twitter recently, last week, yesterday, posted a picture of a burgundy rosé and said, this is my favorite rosé. And somebody said, uh, those grapes must have come from Grand uh, Cru uh, vineyards. Um, it must have cost a lot of money. And so the person replied and said about £30. And there was a little gasp of horror. And I said, but why? It's made from top quality grapes. It's made by a top quality winemaker. Why should it not be able to have that uh, cost? And I think that's part of mm. people, you know, as soon as people recognize that it's not just a price that for marketing reasons is because it reflects the quality of the wine, until that is accepted, maybe men won't be quite so keen, theory, mm. Mm. not sure. Mm. I can't speak on their behalf. I'm drinking their wines instead. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 do, I do tell you one thing. I, it really, really bothers me when rosé disappears from wine menus in September. Well, you're lucky if you get them on a wine menu mm. even before September. Mm. Um, you know, it's sort of like three bottles, isn't it? Three, a choice of three, and then they say, as you say, September, it's the end of the season, we're not going to have it. Yes. Um, which is one reason why I wrote the article about rosé and food, because I thought a number of the dishes were quite autumnal. Yes. Quite rich and... Um, that was quite interesting. Uh, you talk about the growth of rosé, and we'll, we'll talk specifically about countries in just a moment. Uh, rosé uh, um, rose 10% in worldwide sales, according to your book. And in France, of course, I love this, 30% of wine consumed is rosé. This is this is the most difficult chapter of all to deal with. Um, and in fact, I enrolled my husband, who has a MBA um, to really look at the statistics so that I didn't get swept away. And it's any statistician um, will say, you can say something rises by so much percent, what you need to evaluate is what was the baseline that it rose up from. So the, some of these statistics look absolutely amazing that sales are soaring, but they really did start from, from nothing. So we're still looking at quite low um, quantities. The other thing that statistics is a difficulty with rosé. Um, say in Italy and well, lots of other countries, statistics of wine made is divided between how many red grapes are planted and how many white grapes mm. are planted. So the evaluation of what is rosé is only if you've got the sales statistics. Sure. You can't go by what's grown. So again, you've got this sort of conflict of um, information. And what those statistics about rosé drinking in France does not include is that during the summer months, there is an enormous amount. If you go around French supermarkets, rosé-flavored, fruit-flavored rosés. Yeah. So you have grapefruit rosé, cherry rosé. Mm. They're, you know, mixers, aperitifs. And that pushes up an enormous amount of the statistics on how much rosé is. There drunk. may be there may be no recovering from that. I'm afraid. I'm uh, afraid not. No. Elizabeth uh, Gabay is a master of wine, and her book is called "Rosé: Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution." And you are writing online as well, are you not? I am indeed. Yes, um, I've sort of I've got my own website. I'm looking at which is elizabethgabay.com. I'm aiming to, to launch a, a website uh, purely dedicated to rosé. Thank you. Um, which hopefully will be a bit more serious and follow along some of the things I've discussed already and for a number of other magazines, um, print and online. Let me, uh, let me set this up uh, properly, uh, Elizabeth. You, uh, you've tasted uh, as many as 10 bottles a day, a total of 1,500 bottles over a six-month period. You... 
you, you had toured the world through Spain and Portugal and Italy, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Malta, Lebanon, Israel, Turkey, Greece, bear with me, Crimea, Roma, Romania, Croatia, Serbia, Slovakia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Hungary, America, Canada, Uruguay. Uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. But let's stop at Canada for just a moment. Did, did you know anything about our, uh, our Canadian wine industry? Right. So I have to be perfectly honest. I did not go to Canada to taste the rosés. I tasted wines that came over here. All right. Um, and I, so I said, this is like, you know, being really, really honest. Um, I had a six-month contract to write the book. So visiting everywhere while researching the book wasn't possible. So a lot of it was retrospective sure. um, research. Um, one of the we coming back to this idea of whether rosé is valued or not. So I would talk to producers and I would say, when you come over to Europe, can you bring some rosé? And they would say, no, because we want to show our red and our white wines. Nobody is interested in the rosé. Oh my. So that was major problem number one. Major problem number two was saying to people, can you send me a sample of your rosé? No, it's not worth it because we're never going to export. We don't really want anyone to know about it. <laughs> so I kept on coming up against brick walls, um, especially from America and Canada, um, and a bit from Australia. Nobody really wanted to bring the rosés over here for me to try or to discuss it. It was just not on the radar. So in the end, um, I ended up doing an enormous amount of uh, secondhand research, talking to other people, mm -hmm. saying, OK, this is the situation. I'm trying to write about rosé around the world. You don't want necessarily to tell me, so let's have a look at what you think I should be knowing. Uh, we, I thought that was just as valid in a way. Did you reach out to other um, masters of wine? I did, um, none of which were really interested in rosé either. Um, <laughs> So this was the major problem with the book. Um, as, I, as I said earlier on, there are a lot of wine professionals who did not regard this as a subject worthwhile to push any further. But, but, uh, you, but you did talk about uh, Bella. Yes. I, I, I reached out um, and sort of talking to, to people about uh, Rosé. And, and I, on Twitter, Twitter was my big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people who had no axe to grind actually did reach out to me via Twitter and say, OK, we can talk to you. There was no no snobbery there. Well, I, uh, of course, uh, Bella is making um, uh, gamay grown um, uh, um, sparkling wines that I love, uh, method uh, yes. ancestral, um, really trying different things, natural wines, trying very, very much to let the wine speak for itself. So they were, when I, so when um, they were amongst I think two or three people. There was Stags who Hollow. I actually thought, yeah, you know, th I felt quite excited. Um, and I'm hoping, I mean, I'm, I've talked to the publishers about this. I said, I'd really like to do a second edition because having got this far, um, it's gained confidence. And maybe those, there are some people who I think deserve a bit more of a further coverage. Um, does that make sense? It does make sense. No, and I'm encouraging, I mean, but I mean, you have so many other projects, I'm sure, that you could be writing about. I, I, um, yes, I mean, I write a lot about various other regions and grape varieties. I've, I, I've become really seduced by the rosé. It really, as I say, that's why I mentioned the ugly duckling um, turning into the swan. You really want to sort of look after it and encourage it, and it needs that encouragement. So, yeah. Elizabeth Gabay, Master of Wine. The book is Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. And I'm, I'm she doesn't have to convince me of, of too much. I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple already. Um, now, social media is, interesting, uh, is interested in rosé and vice versa. It seems to be the way that rosé is growing its consumer base. It is on Instagram, and then we come back to this, you know, the 20-year-olds and glasses of rosé with sunsets and by pools and on the beach. Uh, that has been a major, major um, cause for an increase in rosé drinking, just because it looks so beautiful. And it is. I mean, it's a stunning-looking wine. 
Um, so I think, yes, Instagram has been very good. I use Twitter for more for information than the visuals. Sure. Um, you know, you could reach out to winemakers, um, and then the sort of word of mouth trickling through was very good. Um, I wonder whether uh, Instagram, I mean, I, I guess in, sure. Instagram must just reach out to that younger audience. It's, it's a very much uh, a divided audience. Mm-hmm. Instagram is this, yeah is, isn't, it, isn't it sort of a much younger I don't know how many how many older people um, older people that, my age that would are, be, are going that would, to be using Instagram to, for, for buying that would be me but I don't overuse it it's 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 a much slower uh, cycle process but I and I chose I choose wisely it's as simple as that yes um, exactly now um, let me see August the fourteenth uh, the a Tuesday is International Rosé Day. Um, the USA Rosé Day is the second Saturday in June. Mm-hmm. Um, when do you uh, go through, because you are the president um, uh, president of the judging of the International Rosé uh, uh, Championships, yes. ha- have you just gone through your championships? Yeah, we had, um, last year was the first year, and we had the uh, championship in May. This year... We moved it back to April so that by the time the results came out, there was um, producers were able to follow that up. And, and, a, 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 and you gathered in Krakow, Poland? Yes. So one of the interesting things for this is that there's, uh, Poland is a very, very big, fast-growing wine market. Mm-hmm. Um, growing number of sommeliers, their, their restaurant trade is growing. And this was a particular wine magazine um Chas Vino who had this idea that they they had a few ideas for a rosé competition and they asked me and I said yes I'm very happy to do that but in particular for rosé I don't want the wines to be judged by adding up numbers sure I felt I said you know and I, I really want it to be so that the judges can discuss and which means that we will give good marks even to rosés which are outside the normal commercial style. As a result, your winners were from Calabria and, and Portugal? Yes. Mm. What should we know about them? We probably will never see them. Um, well, we're hoping. We had uh, Remy Charest as one of the judges this year um, because we are, we're hoping that we're going to be able to maybe attract a few American and Canadian rosés into the competition next year. Very nice. Um, which we, we would really, really like. So what we found with the competition, a um, lot of people ask this, why does rosé not do so well compared with red and white wines in a competition? Mm-hmm. And if you look at red and white wines, competition winners... They have a lot that you can talk about. They have a lot of fruit. They have a lot of aromatics. Um, that It gives a, a judge a lot to hang points onto. And you, it's exactly the same with rosé. You can have a very light, elegant, fresh rosé, and then you can have a rosé, say, from Calabria that has structure and fruit and acidity. <laughs> and you suddenly think, whoa, this is a real wine. I'm actually enjoying this. There is so much going on. Hmm. And I think it's exactly the same. So the South Italian, the Southern Italian rosés, I think are phenomenal. Um, I, every time I keep tasting them, I, I just think you know, they have interesting grape varieties. They have interesting range of styles. They have lots of ripe fruit, very good acidity. You know, what's not to like, really? I have my eye on one region, Elizabeth, mm. and it's Croatia. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, I don't think I don't think I can talk about Croatia today, can I? Really? Mm. No. Anyway, yes, Croatia. They uh, have been making it for quite some time. Seem to have the great handle on rosé. I've tasted some fabulous rosés from Croatia. And I'm quite impressed. I I think that again we're coming back to them using uh, interesting grape varieties that. A bit like Greece, Croatia, southern Italy, these are varieties that have adapted to hot weather. Mm. So they've retained good acidity, um, even if you allow the grapes to ripen quite a lot. So you have this balance of fruit and acidity. 
And I think I've tasted some not so exciting Croatian rosés where they've tried to be modern and pale and pink and commercial. But the producers that have stuck to this is our style. Sure. They're the ones that shine. This is what we've done. This is our tradition. And yeah. I, I love the traditions that you mentioned uh, uh, all along the way within the book. And finally, just about Canada, um, we, you make the note that the imported rosé in Canada rose 116% between 2012 and 2016. Canadian production only grew 9%. However, I believe if you revisited those numbers, you would find many, many more uh, rosés being made in Canada. And, and for those who are playing catch-up, it, I, it's, uh, I don't want to discourage anyone, but uh, you have to get it right. You simply you can't just make a, a colored wine and say, yes, you're in the rosé business. I think that, that is a major, major problem. So um, some of the rosés I tasted from Canada um, were depressing. <laughs> um, but not just because they're Canadian. I, I think, I have, let's be honest, a lot of rosés I tasted from around the world were extremely depressing. Yes. Um, and when you're faced with a case of rosé that you have to get through, and I kept saying, okay, let's just taste those rosés again. Have I been really fair to them? Am I being nasty to them? Let's taste again. Um, so you'd keep tasting over and over again. Um, and... Yeah, no, I think actually maybe what I need to do is is get out to Canada and um, try some more rosés. But whether whether I, I would have a long enough trip, I don't know. I have believe to think it, on that one. Well, well, actually, what's happened now, of course, is that both coasts are producing uh, some incredible bubble um, um, and some of it rosé, uh, starting at, just outside of uh, Halifax in the Gasparo Valley. And then where, yeah. I, where I am on Vancouver Island, the same thing. It's the same sort of terroir. Uh, in the middle, it's Ontario. Quebec is, of course, has always been a home for rosé, always welcome there, and they're making their own now. But really, the Okanagan, it's Ontario and the Okanagan in Prince Edward County. Um, well, that was something I think we don't realize when we're over in Europe, that... Um, having tasted, you know, both sides, just what a strong characteristic there is. It's not Canadian rosé. Um, it's like saying European rosé. Um, and I, I would love to be able to just discover so much more about it. Um, I felt there were some interesting things going on. You know, I, lo- I love this idea of using Canadian ice wine for the dosage and sparkling yes, wine. Yes, exactly. You know, just to give it that extra bit of um, local character. Um, I liked the combination of varieties, which we're not used to over here. Um, I thought that was really good. And Gamay Rosé, um, we've go. just talked about. I think I, uh, I'm increasingly uh, excited by Gamay as a rosé. Well, welcome uh, to my bandwagon because I'm a total, complete Gamay Rosé fan. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Ah, so actually, going back to that. So I was, um, I tasted a load of Gamays for rosé, and I kept saying it's got, it's just got that lovely mineral core, um, lovely fruit, lovely freshness. It's, it doesn't have the tannin. that You don't have to fight tannin to appreciate mm-hmm. it. Yes. And I was writing up my tasting notes for Gamay Rosé. And then the next day, I was writing up um, some tasting notes for Chiaretto from Bardolino. And I thought, oh, you know, as tasting notes, how would I differentiate these if I was doing a blind master of wine tasting? So I was in Chiaretto uh, last month, and I showed them a Gamay Rosé. And there was a sort of gasp around the room as everyone went, yes, <laughs> we, we have an affiliation between the two. And in fact, we're going back, I'm going back at the end of September. Um, Beaujolais producers have been invited to Bardolino to carry on this discussion because there is this wonderful link of fruit style which I thought was very exciting, you know. I, we're, we're all used to dry rosé, but this is the cherry fruit rosé with right. mineral core. Uh, all right, Elizabeth, three questions, I'll let you go. One is, well, actually, the last one is an observation. Um, uh, uh, what can we tell the the listener who is, has been walking around the outside of rosé thinking, do I belong here? 
can you can you give them one um, entrance and piece of advice on looking for a rosé? Yeah. Um, that first rosé. What would I say? I think for me, the thing that I learnt most of all was um, get rid of any preconceptions of what you think a rosé should be. Which sounds quite easy, but I think um, we are so often, because of this summer image, we're thinking of a wine that should just be refreshing and and dry. Um, So before you've even bought the wine, don't judge the wine by the colour. Don't think it's going to be always light and dry, so that you're a blank sheet of paper. Don't go for the cheapest. Uh... I think starting on any wine style, going for the cheapest, you may not get the full character of the wine. Could I suggest maybe starting in Provence? No, because I think Provence is... Well, yeah, you could... Okay. Because um, you, you could... to some producers who... Uh, producers, some, some of the bigger people. I, I've got a funny feeling. I've got... Just things that people have said. Provence rosé that is shipped to America is not always the same as the wine that is sold here. Ah. I think there are a number of rosés that are available in North America that potentially are fruitier, maybe a hint more residual sugar. Hmm. Um because I've tasted some wines next to each other where one was for the North American market and one was for France, and they are quite different. Okay. Uh, all right. My, my second question is, I was, I was at a music festival yesterday, and I had a conversation, struck up a conversation backstage with Martin Simpson, an amazing guitarist from Britain. And uh, I said, how's the wine industry? He said, remarkably growing and wonderful. He said, I was... I was not prepared to be won over, but I'm drinking English wines now. What's going on, Elizabeth? They are just, I mean, this summer is just hot and dry, yeah. and the crop is looking absolutely phenomenal. They, the vines are getting older, so we're getting a bit more flavor, but they are phenomenal. Um, the sparkling wines are just stunning. I mean, really top, top quality. They've got um, beautiful balance. They've got some really exciting winemakers being involved. In fact, this week, um, the winemaker from Night Timber was just awarded the Winemaker of the Year Award. Um, They have vineyards going as far north as Yorkshire, going up towards Scotland. So climate change is making a big difference. I think there's... um, They've got classic varieties, but they also have a mix of, you know, um, crosses from Germany. I don't know. It's just going from strength to strength. They're not cheap. Yes. Um, Not cheap at all. But this is going back to to the last question. What wine would you recommend? And I think rosé, because it is not a wine that is um, naturally attracting very high prices, you know, it's not like red wine and white wine where you've got big name winemakers behind it. If you find a rosé that is a fraction more expensive, I think you're more likely to get value for money. You know, there's the cheap commercial brand yes. uh, belt, and that middle band, I think you're far more likely to say that is good value for money. You'll know. Your instincts will tell you. Uh, yeah. You can also tell, ask your rosé friends. Here's your, my final. It's an observation. We are speaking, uh, Elizabeth and I, the day after France has won the World Cup. And um, I'm kind of wondering, how was that Sunday in, in France? What, what, were you, what, what were you hearing? What were you feeling? Well, it's been a, um, a very um, exciting weekend for us because Saturday was our national holiday, 14th of July. Mm. Um, so everyone was feeling sort of quite festive anyway. Then yesterday, there was every village, I mean, our village, I live in a small village, big screen up outside the town hall with everybody watching. And then just every time when there was a goal, you could hear cars and sh- hooting, people shouting. 
And then my daughter suddenly said, I think France has won. And there was this enormous cheer around the village. It was absolutely amazing. Excited. It kind of feels like France is, you know, we're, we're on a runner at the moment. Mm. We've had bad luck with weather vintage-wise, but yeah, you know, great, fantastic, really pleased. Have you formed the next book? I've been working on one book for a number of years now, um, which I think will probably be the next book, which is uh, not on wine. It's on the, the drink punch. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so that is, I've done the research, and it now needs to be cut by about 90% to make it into a book. Um, and with an, another book is with another writer um, looking at doing something just on Provence. Um, so there are a couple of options going through. Um, there are a couple of other people I've been discussing ideas with, um, and a second edition of Rosé. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank oh, you. Oh, I no, I'm oh. I'm, I'm neglecting oh. my duty. Your website, how people find you? How people find me? Well, uh, to find the book is uh, Pink Dot Wine, um, nice and simple. Or my website is elizabethgabay.com. dot uh, com. G A B A Y elizabethgabay.com, dot right. com. Right. Yes, and that I put. Uh, when I've got time, I write uh, wine articles. I can be reached through that, and that will eventually announce when my rosé website is up and running. The book is Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. I am a total rosé head, and I invite you to go and find this book. Read it online, however you wish. Elizabeth Gabay, Master of Wine, Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. We thank her for joining us on Tasting Room Radio and Mulligan's to the podcast. I'm Terry David Mulligan. Elizabeth Gabay, Master of Wine, and her book, Rosé, Understanding the Pink Wine Revolution. As she said, you can find her book at pink.wine uh, in elizabethgabay.com, G-A-B-A-Y. The book uh, can be found. It's a wonderful read. It's something you find yourself picking up and going back to uh, just to check on elements of the rosé that you happen to be drinking. If if you, by the way, if, if you're out there and you have never uh, had a rosé, maybe it's too late. <laughs> maybe it's too late for you. But um, I'll drink your share if that's okay. Uh, there's some wonder, and they're fantastic. And if you if you if you tried a rosé or a blush when you were growing up and your parents were drinking it, it's not the same rosé anymore. It's fantastic. And and myself uh, and my wife Meg drink rosé year round, year round, dead of winter. It goes beautifully with turkey and chicken, oh, all sorts of stuff. Thank you for listening. By the way, the home show for the wine conversation is Tasting Room Radio, and you can find it at tastingroomradio.com. It's podcast on Google Play Music and Apple Podcasts. And if you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the podcasts. Thank you so much. I'm Terry David Mulligan. Cheers.